Yes, so we are the church. I want to welcome everyone across our venues who are here with us today. We're so thankful that you're here on this exciting Sunday as we celebrate our 80th anniversary as a church. That group that gathered in 1939 on October 26th could have never imagined what God would do through our church in the decades to follow. Many of us have been here for some time. Others of us have just shown up recently, but we're glad that you're here. And again, welcome to all of our guests. You're invited to join us uh, for lunch today. What a wonderful day it is. Today, I'm gonna talk about passing the baton on to the next generation. This coming summer, you may not know, uh, the Summer Olympics are coming to Japan, actually. I love the Summer Olympics, and probably my favorite event is the four by 100 relay. Because every athlete, every leg of the race is kicking it as hard as possible. They're running as fast as they can. And then there's always the precarious baton change. The exchange, which is always a little bit scary. So I've got my baton today. I wanna talk about passing the baton on to the next generation. You might remember that in 2004, Four, our women in particular have been favored for years and years. 2004, we were in Athens and uh, they dropped the baton, disqualified. You got to have a clean pass of the baton. And then in Beijing, 2008, favored again. Some of the same team members on that team dropped the baton, failed to qualify. They're out, didn't cross the finish line. 2012 in London, they gathered again with great hopes for redemption. And if you remember this race, they broke the world record, clean passes all the way through, shattered a 27-year-old record set by the East Germans year after year. We all know they were doping, but that's another story. (laughs) Um, Legit were. But Carmelita Jeter, our anchor in that race, ran a 97 100 meters. Now the reason she's running so fast is because there's an exchange zone. There's an acceleration zone, an exchange zone. She's kicking the backside of that exchange zone as fast as she can go. And she crossed the line and we crushed a world record. 40.82 seconds. Today I want to talk about passing the baton, a clean pass, seamless exchange from one generation to the next. That's why we're here today. We're celebrating those who've gone before us, who've passed the baton on to us. We've said in recent days that we are a church, we are the church, and that we are enduring. We looked at the past a couple of weeks ago. Last week we said we are prevailing. That even in our day, we talked about this cultural moment we find ourselves in. And I came to you from the Latino service over in the gym. Uh, We had a great time uh, just worshiping together. And today I'm coming, of course, from the sanctuary to everyone as we talk about how we are advancing. Of course, the church has advanced for 2,000 years and continues to advance in every culture, every language, among people across the globe. Now, not every generation and every culture has prevailed. Not every local church has prevailed. We're not promised another 80 years, but as long as we remain faithful to fix our eyes on Jesus, remain centered on the Great Commission and what he's called us to, we will have been faithful in our moment, our exchange zone in our time. Now, in recent days, I've shown you this diagram that that I think helps us understand our cultural moment, where we find ourselves. Now, every generation has faced challenges. Every culture faces challenges today. Many believers are being persecuted across the globe today. Now, we are seeing a growing opposition in America, but the diagram shows us where we find ourselves. We're in a post-Christian culture. Now, many would say Dallas is a bit behind the rest of the nation, but it's coming. All signs are are pointing to us, and we're seeing it more and more. It's that undercurrent of tension we find in our our culture today. It leads to a secular worldview. A secular meaning earthly, worldly. It's life under the sun. It's it's non-spiritual is what it is. We're left to fend and figure out what this life is about apart from God. 
And this is where we're seeing our nation, even our neighbors, our city go. All living in digital Babylon. As exiles, we talked about last week. Sojourners in a foreign land, learning more from what's coming at us in culture, from the screens we find ourselves in front of, from the internet, and less and less from God's word. And it is spiritually forming and shaping our lives. And we're seeing the impact of that. And then tag to that, add to that a false gospel. The gospel has not been passed from one generation to the next as it should. We have a work harder, get better kind of prosperity gospel that rules the day. And will bring no power or hope to anyone who seeks to follow after it. This past week, you may have seen our Attorney General, William Barr, who gave a speech at Notre Dame. Now, I don't know, I don't know much about Barr. I know he's a Catholic. Uh, he's been under the spotlight a lot, and particularly uh, because he offered his own cultural commentary on where we are as a nation. And he said this, religion helps frame moral culture within society that instills and reinforces moral discipline. He said, a growing secularism and the doctrine of moral relativism is the problem in our nation today. And this is where he he took a lot of heat. He's, He's preaching now. And he said this, we're told we live in a post Christian culture. His words, not, not mine. But he asked the question, what has replaced this Judeo Christian era? What have we replaced it with? And he said this, a secular, non-spiritual worldview. And it's left, here's what he said, it has left a spiritual void in the hearts of individuals. Again, whatever you might say about William Barr, he is dead on with his commentary here. It's what we've been talking about in recent days. These are challenging days in America, to place us in our context. But every generation has faced challenges. Our church, can you imagine? Our church is, 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 is founded, it's planted just prior to World War II. Our nation moving into, in fact, that year, 1939, Germany on the border of Poland. And, and then we enter into, we, we're, we're neutral, but that's the year that the war began. So we've always faced challenges. But the temptation, I think, in our day has been the same every, in every era. It's kind of this us against them. Not only us against culture, but us against even uh, following uh, and successive generations. This past week, I read again this, this quote, uh, children now love luxuries. I mean, think about this. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders. They they no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents. They tyrannize their teachers. I said I read it this week. That was Socrates in 400 BC. This has always been the case. Every generation has thrown shade at, at a generation that's following them. But it should be different in the church. I've heard so much about the millennials. You know, for a couple decades now, we're talking about the millennials, right? Of course, now it's Gen Z, those who are in middle school and high school and on into college. Um, Our problem is not a generational problem, friends. Listen, this is a word for the church. The problem is not a generational problem. We have a discipleship problem. We're not passing the gospel on to the next generation. And I want to say this. People my age, gosh, even even much younger, but particularly those of us who are older. If you're not investing, if you're not spending time with younger people, someone younger than you, if you're not discipling, mentoring, pouring into their lives, I'm going to ask you respectfully to stop criticizing them. And instead, turn to those that you know, the influence that you have, and, and this is, we don't wait on a program. It's the kingdom program. It's to seek out those that we can disciple, mentor, spend time with. Listen, follow me as I follow Jesus. Every single one of us are to make disciples. That's how the baton is passed on. So Peter gave us the starting point. A, a central verse that we've looked at in these days, Matthew 16, 18, says this. When he proclaimed that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah... 
Jesus responded, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, this foundational rock of that proclamation of who I am, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We see the church on the move, offensively pressing into the gates of hell, dispelling the darkness, going forth, not hiding out, not defensive posture, but an offensive move. This is the way that we proclaim the gospel in every life, every person we encounter. In fact, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at how we can pass the gospel on in our generation, in our day. Everyone turning to Hebrews 12. This is a passage we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And I want us to look at it again. Here the writer is writing to early believers, Christians, under great persecution. They're under the Roman Emperor Nero. And if you know anything about history, church history, you know that there was great persecution under Nero's reign. And so he challenges them in Hebrews 11 to say, let's look at those who've been faithful to challenge us to be faithful in our moment. So he says that the gospel's been passed on, uh, the baton of faith passed on from successive generations, one after another. And then he says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, the beginning and the end, the one who has completed the task of faith for us, who, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, this place of authority. Notice the image of the Christian life is that of a race. We've noted that word race is the word agon. It's where we get our word agony. This is not a a sprint. The Christian life is a long, yes, difficult and challenging race. And so he says, I want you to be faithful. Look at what he says. He says, consider the crowd, those who've gone before us. And look at the finishers and be, be encouraged by them. But we've got to look at them, he says. Consider them. I'd also say this, in a relay race, you've got to stay in your lane. It says, run the race set before you. Run the race you've been given. This is a real challenge in our day. Stop looking at other people running their race. Don't compare yourself with someone else. Run your leg. And right now, friends, this is our time. This is our moment. We're running our race, and I'm challenging us to be faithful in our moment. Think about this. As he says, lay aside every weight, anything that is excess. What are you carrying that you need to set aside? He he says, the sin that so easily entangles us. What ongoing habits do you you fall into? Destructive patterns that you need to lay aside. Let the Spirit speak into your heart, even now. What sin are you wrestling with that you need help with? What do you need to confess before the Lord today? We we need to to lay aside everything that we're carrying that is keeping us from running the race. Then he says, focus on Jesus. Are you abiding in him? Friends, this is the Christian life. Success in the Christian life is abiding in Jesus. He said, if you abide in me, I'm running this race with you. In the Great Commission, he says, I will be with you always. But listen, don't miss this. It's if we're running his race. I will be with you. If we're off doing things that he's not about, he's not with us. He's not going to empower us. We must run his race that he's given to us. We can say that Jesus has passed the baton to us. And yes, he runs with us. He's the focus of our race. He's the one at the finish line waiting for us. But he's also running with us if we're abiding in him. John 15, if we're faithful day to day. Now, last Saturday, you may have seen Eliud uh, Kipchoge ran a marathon in under two hours. Did you see this? Has it never happened before in the history of the world? He ran under two hours by just 20 seconds. But it's unofficial because he didn't do it alone. 
He had a large team of people around him. He didn't have to slow down for drinks or anything. He had special shoes that are being challenged a little bit, but he ran. Under two hours he ran this marathon. He broke the barrier and, and he, he, he set his heart on this goal and he broke it. He tried previously. This time he did it. It's not unlike uh, when you think about Roger Bannister's four-minute mile. Breaking this barrier so that others who come behind him say, this can be done. Someone's done this. And we're going to see the two-hour mark broken again. Because now other runners are saying, this can happen. We do the same. We're examples for others who come after us. We show them what it is to walk with Jesus every day as we fix our eyes on him. And they say, I want to live my life that way. Who's watching you? Many people in your life are watching you. What kind of example are you giving to them? I praise God for those who have gone before me, those in our church who are an inspiration to their pastor. I praise God for so many that I can name person after person in our church family who challenged me and encouraged me to run the race. But think about this. Kipchoge ran the marathon and his average pace was 433 for 26 plus miles. Other runners are coming behind him saying, this can happen. And so we, we push through and we push our young people forward to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. Don't give up. See, the point of the Christian life is, here's my point. He didn't run this thing alone. He could not have done it alone. Nor can you. We're not meant to run this race alone. And if you're here today and you're not yet a member of our church, I want, to, I want to challenge you to join the fellowship today. We can't run this race without others around us. And so the Lord has given us each other. Now he says you're going to have to get rid of, uh, you're going to have to get rid of some things in your life. You know, none of us would, would ever imagine someone getting up to the block. You've seen them. Kip, Kipchoge was, was, I mean, almost just, just wearing nothing, little shorts and light top, and he had these special shoes, evidently Nikes, but he's running. But you can't imagine someone getting up, running up there, and they're going through the, the, the you know, at the block, starting block, someone's got a big winter coat on, just showing up, maybe got a to, you know, toboggan on, a little chilly out, got his work boots on, uh, somebody carrying uh, weights up there. I mean, unless you're in, like, unless you're a CrossFitter, you know, cult, um, you know, getting up there. And, and you're ready to run the race. Nobody would do that. Do you realize that back in ancient Greece, in fact, uh, the Greeks, males only, would run the Olympics and they would, they would be in those events stripped down. Totally. I was about to say, this is when all of our elementary school boys can giggle. I mean, go ahead. You can giggle. Because they would, they would be totally stripped down. Now we think, that's so weird. Or they really wanted to win this thing. You've got to get rid of everything that's holding you back. And together, as we do as a church, rid ourselves of everything that's ineffective and not allowing us to press on and to share the gospel with the next generation. We've got to change in order to do so. And we do it together. We run this race together. Unity is all of us moving in the same direction. And uniformity is no everybody like me. No, uniformity is diversity and everyone moving forward. And I want to say this. You don't have to be a super Christian to be involved. None of us are. What I don't want you to hear me say is just run harder, run faster, get better, work really hard, and go. That's not the gospel. Instead, it's his power in us, the spirit in us, that keeps us pressing on. So listen, run your race. Every person matters. Every generation matters. Every gift that comes to bear on the work of the church matters. You matter. Don't only run your race. Look at this neck. Don't give up. Secondly, don't give up. Finish your leg. Be faithful in the moment. You know, many of us are struggling in our lives today, all of us in varying degrees. The Christian life is a difficult, difficult race to run. And I just want to encourage you today. I want to pause and encourage every single one of us. But I want, I want to bring a challenge as well. Some of you might feel like you're all alone in these days. 
You, you wish that you had someone in your life who was special or you're walking through some challenges that maybe you feel like nobody knows about. I would encourage you to share your burden with others. That's what we do as a church. But you might be feeling alone and the writer says, look at Moses. He felt all alone through much of his ministry. And some of us here today are thinking, well, I'm, Jeff, God's been faithful to me, but I'm, I'm kind of getting old and, and I don't know if I really have a place anymore. He says, no, no, no. Look at Moses, but look at Abraham. I started with him at 80 years old. That's when these men did their best work. And others of us are feeling, well, gosh, I'm, I'm still sorting through things from my family of origin. It was so messed up. Or I've got father wounds that I'm just now unpacking. I'm dealing with a lot of my life, and I just, I don't know if I'll ever be normal. My family was so dysfunctional. The writer said, no, 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 look at, no, look at Joseph, the most dysfunctional family on the planet. And God used him mightily. Listen, implied in all of this, you've got to know the scriptures. Consider those who've gone before you, but you must know his word to do so. Otherwise, you're running around in an empty stadium. Friends, listen, when we're in the word, knowing how God's been faithful in the past, when we're with others who, who can tell us stories or just being here together today, 80 years, we're reminded of God's faithfulness. And, and listen, this is what you call home field advantage is what this is. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. In this room, I know you're listening in the gym or in the great hall. I'm looking around this room. There's a great cloud of witnesses right here. I imagine a stadium with people who've gone before us for 80 years. And those throughout scripture. I think of those through the, through the Reformation. I think of those early believers of Paul and Peter. They're cheering us on all the way back to Abraham cheering us on to say, yes, run, run, run this race. Listen, do you need encouragement today? Be devoted to the church, to one another. You'll be encouraged. So run your race. Don't give up. And finally, pass the baton. In a relay race, you've got the exchange zone. It's a 20-meter zone. And you've got just a moment to pass that baton on, and if you go before it, after it, you're disqualified, you're out. But friends, here's my concern, is that some of us are missing our moment. We've been given the baton, we're not passing it on, we're, eat, we're holding on to it. How crazy would that be? The, the, the outgoing runner finds themselves giving you a target, and you, you choose not to pass it on. Now, here's what happens. The incoming runner running as fast as they can. Here's what you want to see. You want them to run as fast all the way through the exchange zone. The person in the back gives them a clear target because they have the eyes. Those of us coming with, with younger people in front of us, we have the eyes. We've got wisdom. We know where to place the baton. And they're looking for it. But young people, listen, you got to give us a target. In other words, you've got to be running the race. You too need to be running the race in this day. And so that we can hit at maximum speed, filled with the Spirit. We run the race that God's given to us and we place it squarely in the hands of those who are coming after us. Who are, whom are you discipling? Whom are you mentoring? Who are you encouraging in your, in your walk? Many of you, you may struggle with that. Or you might say, well, I got some grand, grandkids. I'm trying. Okay. I would encourage you in your, praise be to God, that, that's your primary role perhaps, or your children, that's your primary place. But many of us could be serving our students, serving our young people, our children. You see, the greatest deterrent for churches that have been around a long period of time is that we can grow to love the past more than we love those who are coming after us. And we don't pass the gospel on. We, we hold on to it when we determine we will not change. We're not going to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just settle into a sin of entitlement. I've been here a long time. 
This is my church. Now listen, this is his church, and he's, and he's calling us to pass it on to the next generation. I praise God. I could go a long time here for our leaders, lay leadership. I think of deacon leaders who said, let's, let's, let's pass this baton on. Let's raise up young leaders across our campus. But I want to challenge all of our young, young people to rise up. You're never too young. You're never too old. And God is calling us all to run the race to pass the baton. Now, let me do this briefly as I close. And then I'm going to offer a challenge to us all. I want to offer a vision forward, 2020. There's much to be said about this. So this is broad breaststrokes. We're looking at uh, into detail. Even now, we've got a long-range planning committee group that's meeting of incredible, courageous leaders. But I want to just lay this out for us as we look for the next year and the years to come, the next 80 years to come. We're going to be committed to prayer and the Word. That's going to be central for us. Spirit and truth will guide us as a church family. God's Word will remain central to all that we do, pointing everyone to Jesus We're going to align all things to our strategy to worship, connect, serve, and to multiply as a lifestyle. In our our worship services, you may not know, some of you, right now the Great Hall is packed, way beyond 80% week after week. We've got to figure that one out, frankly. It's exciting, but we've got some challenges ahead. Next Gen Ministries will be our focus in the coming years, as it has been. Our family ministry team, even our our, our PCBC kids ministry has has been restructured to include sports ministry, kids worship, uh, outreach, Wednesday nights, all that we're doing unified to help the child grow in the Lord Jesus. I'm excited to introduce, we'll we'll introduce soon a new girls minister who's going to serve in our student ministry with our young people. We've got Hispanic ministries we talked about last week with a new pastor who, who, who's coming. We're hopeful as we continue to search, uh, but we believe that soon and very soon, God's gonna raise up that Latino leader and we're gonna resource, we're gonna celebrate and expand that ministry as we talked about last week. We're looking at a leadership pipeline already uh, moving across our campus and in every ministry, raising up every one of us out of a mindset. Who am I raising up? Who am I investing in? Who's going to be the one to take the baton from me? I'm looking at vocational collectives where we're going to gather people from the marketplace in certain domains of culture, different vocational callings to encourage each other. How do you live out your faith in your workplace? And we're going to continue to advance the gospel. We have actually entered into a partnership I'm most excited about with Texas Baptist. We now have established a church pastoral center. It's really now a church planting center. We have five young pastors who are being raised up, trained every week to plant church here in Dallas. And we're so thrilled about this ministry to come and all that will happen in the days to come. And I mentioned a long-range planning group that's now now working as we envision the next 20 years to our 100th anniversary and beyond. These are exciting days. And what I want to do now to close this message is to offer a visual for you. I've asked some people to come and join me here on the platform. Now, I could have chosen a host of people from our congregation And I've asked them to come up here. What we have, you're going to see, are people from different generations, if you will, from our church family. And uh, we're going to uh, give you a visual image of passing the gospel on from one to another. Now, we're going to start with the youngest at heart, because right down here is Elizabeth Mills. Elizabeth has been a member of our church, I know this, from 1947. So she's been here. We have lots of stories we could tell, and I could embarrass her a lot. It would be fun, but I'm not going to do that. She's one of my precious friends. Love Elizabeth. But I'm going to give you, Elizabeth, I'm going to give you this baton, okay? She remembers us being back uh, in Lover's Lane, in the house. You remember that? As a little girl. I think you're like, really little girl, right? (laughs) Not that little. Yeah, yeah. No, you're very young. Back on Lover's Lane. She has seen it happen, gang, over the years. And so I'm going to ask you, you're going to pass the baton on to the next generation. John Parker is a mission champion. Many of you know this. Now, if, if Elizabeth represents the builders, she, she passes on to the boomers. Okay, so John is clearly in this boomer generation. Many argue the most influential generation that we've ever had. 
uh, in our, and even still. I mean, he, these guys introduced, they, they invented the computer, okay? So, I mean, this generation is amazing. John is going to, and he's even now raising up other leaders on our mission endeavors, particularly in South Texas. So John's going to pass the baton on to Laura Johnsick. Laura is now our lead deacon, chairwoman of our deacon fellowship. Uh, she, is, she represents really the latter, like, like me, kind of that latter boomer, Gen X, um, kind of, we watched MTV, you know, take over where, where video killed the radio star. And, um, and so Laura now, this generation, watch, she's watching, she's seen in her generation, women rising up in leadership, being empowered. We're going to continue to do that as a church family. She passes it on to Mary Beth Hickman. Now, this is where I get really old, because Mary Beth was actually my youth ministry, um, though she's still 25, uh, which is great. But Mary Beth um, is now, you, yeah, you're clear of this Gen X, right, uh, generation, where she, nobody talks about Gen X. We don't know what to do with y'all. I don't know what's happening. But um, a, a powerful generation in our culture today, and she has been a faithful member, raising her daughters here in our church, passing the gospel on to them. Uh, she and Josh to the next generation. Now, Johnny Merthotti is right here. Johnny is a graduate of DTS. is two degrees, actually. Brilliant. From India. He's now working with our BSM. Okay, Baptist Student Ministries with the Texas Baptists. He's passing the gospel on to college students. All right, so next we have Grant Glover. Grant grew up in this church. Grant's just out of college. He's now in seminary, and he serves in our high school ministry with our high school students. Grant represents really the back end of millennials, Gen Z, right at that edge where he now represents this next generation. He's passing the gospel on to Selena Hernandez. Selena's in the ninth grade. Isn't that right? No. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. I've got her. See, I'm moving her too fast. I want her to run faster or something. She's in the eighth grade, has recently gotten really involved in our student ministry. And the Lord is doing a great work in her life. Now, she's going to pass the gospel on to Corbin Miller. Now, Corbin, Corbin, I want you to come over here. Corbin represents this generation to come. Corbin, it could possibly be that Corbin's going to be around for 80 years. He could be here uh, when the church has now moved on to another 80 years. Corbin represents, so his dad is Jay Miller, our children's minister. And his grandfather has passed the, the gospel on to him, to him and many generations. Now, Corbin, here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you to run your race. As a church family, here's what we're going to do. As your pastor, okay? I know that you came to Christ and were baptized last September, right? Your dad baptized you. So Corbin has come to faith in Jesus. He's got the baton. He's ready to run his race. And so, Corbin, I promise you, as your pastor and your church family around you, so great a cloud of witnesses who are cheering you on. We're going to raise you up to follow Jesus. We're going to teach you how to love his word. We're going to guide you and teach you how to pray. You're going to be able to come alongside your friends, and you're going to be able to take the gospel to your friends in your school all around the world. You've already tried that? Good. Keep on. Keep trying that. Yeah, come on. Keep trying that. So, I know this is true. Because Corbin, he is our little disciple. And God's raised him up along with many who he represents. And here's what we want to do, Corbin. I want to challenge you. I want to ask you. We're going to cheer you on. So, I want you to take that baton. And I'm going to ask you to run in just a moment. But gang, as we do from all, in all of our venues, let's cheer him on. Are y'all ready to cheer him on? Let's do this. Corbin, you ready? Are you ready to go? Okay, ready, set, go. Go take it, Corbin. Go, let's go. Go, Corbin. Yes. There he goes. Woo. <laughs> wow. He's gone. He is gone. Praise be to God. He's gone. Wow. He just took off. I don't know. He's still running. That's amazing. <laughs> Y'all, listen, that's the image I want us to see. Pass the gospel on to those who God has placed right in front of you, okay? So here's what I want to do. I want to pray, and then these folks are going to step down, and, uh, and we're going to continue on in our worship service today. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to run this race in our time right now. And Lord, I pray we'll be faithful 
as we give our lives to you, keeping Christ at the center of our lives, Lord. You've called us to be faithful in the moment, in our our stretch of the race, our leg of the race. So may we be faithful this week, even today, to point others to you. May you bless your church in the next 80 years to come. We pray in Jesus' name.